so good evening everyone and welcome to this edition of societal chats um i'm always so happy to be in this favorite hour of the month when i get to talk to one of my favorite leaders and do that in front of a cohort of my favorite friends so this is great time to be together so thank you so much for joining in today. Uh, Mangalam was just reminding us that this is the ninth chat. Uh, and remember that our um, intent is to um, do three more uh, and then we will have a nice combination of 12 amazing leaders who are driving impact at scale. So that is the whole idea of doing this. Uh, we have shared uh, the background of all of you with um, with our guest today. So let me take the opportunity to introduce the guest. And that is Sharmi, Sharmi Surinarayan. Sharmi, um, by the way, I met Sharmi first time, I think at Bellagio, uh, at the Bellagio Center of Rockefeller, um, and uh, which was quite many moons ago. Uh, but uh, she is the chief impact officer at Harambe Youth Employment Accelerator, and we'll hear more about that from her, which is a fascinating initiative that she and the team are driving, and I find it to be super inspiring. They focus on youth uh, employment uh, uh, in Africa, and so we'll hear more about that as we go along. She's also been founder of Making Caring Count. She's a fellow, like many of us here on the call, um, fellow of Aspen African Leadership Initiative, also a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Um, she's a fierce advocate of many things, and amongst that, the I guess she's the fiercest about opportunity and social justice for the young across the African continent. Uh, focuses on human capital management, education, and creating employment links across Africa, India, and the US. Personally, I admire her for the way she comes across as a very humble leader, very curious leader, and a very caring person. So I am so delighted to have Sharmi here with us today. Welcome, Sharmi. And thank you for sparing uh, an hour in between crazy travel schedules. Um, between She lives in Kenya, and, and she's shuttling between Kenya and South Africa and many other places. But still, she found this hour for us, so I am super grateful. Welcome, Sharmi. Thanks, Sanjay. So nice to be here and honored to be amongst all of you and pleased to be counted as one of Sanjay's favorite people. So I feel very um, in good company. So thanks very much for having me and looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Um, and in the spirit of a chat, we will... Um, keep this as a conversation between us and would love to hear uh, some conversation for about 10 minutes or so and then open the floor for our friends to connect in ask questions make their uh, observations and then back so we'll do that a few times if that's uh, fine as the then it'll be more fun more interactive as a discussion so i think it would be great to begin with hearing from you the story of, of Harambe and the platform that you built. How did you build this like a national asset? There are very few civil society organizations who have been able to sort of start from scratch and build up a national uh, asset. So share with us the journey. You just reflect back what happened and how did you reach to where you are today with SA Youth, which you launched. Um, so look forward to hearing your, your story. Sure, thanks. So today's a very interesting and pivotal moment also for Harambe and SA Youth. We are launching um, a massive campaign to recruit about 300,000 school assistants. It's the phase two of a partnership that we launched last year. Today was it was kicked off, so my team is also scrambling, and it's a kind of crazy time. Um, but it's actually quite interesting. You were mentioning sort of nine nine sessions of societal platform. For us, it feels like nine revolutions around the sun, even from last year. 
Um, but Harambe started 10 years ago in um, South Africa, and it um, was started by a really good friend of mine, Nicola Golombic, who heads up Yellowwood's um, social investments. And she has helped incubate ser a series of social enterprises. But in the beginning, I think, well, some of you may know, but even back then, South Africa's youth unemployment and unemployment in general has been one of the highest in the world. It is the highest today. Um, and it was true back then as well. And Yellowwoods was an interesting um, combination of both public and um, sort of social enterprise and private for-profit um, corporations who are very keen on addressing the demand supply social, uh, the gap between young people coming out of schools, looking for jobs and corporates not looking, able to fill vacancies. So in the very beginning, it was meant to solve that problem, but it was kind of built with scale and systems change from the outset for a couple of reasons. One, we made a choice quite early on to work with the government. So in year, I, I actually say even in year one of our founding, we partnered with um, the government, both the South African government through the Jobs Fund and National Treasury, and then eventually with the city of Johannesburg, uh, where we formed a partnership where a lot of uh, um, South Africa's big businesses are located. And then to last year, and this, this year in particular, where we've launched this massive partnership with um, the presidency. So I would say the story of Harambe started with a point of friction and a specific small problem to solve. Well, small in the sense that it was that interface between demand and supply was small, but it was systemic in its impact. Uh, a young person leaving education um, was not likely to find a job, even if they had the skills and competencies. And lots of employers were looking for, for young people. So the early years were uh, all about iteration. So it was all about trial and error, figuring out what was the issue, um, we looked at why young people weren't able to look access jobs and why employers weren't able to find them. So we saw it was an issue of barriers, for example. So um, young people were not able to afford access to a website or a smartphone or um, even have access to you know, job applications that were legi legible to them and, and you know, understandable to them. So we worked with them on the one side and then employers on the flip side really asked for the move. You, know, you were asking for entry-level job hires, but you wanted three years experience, experience. And so it was really clear that we needed to break down barriers on both sides, uh, both on the demand and the supply side. So we advocated with employers to say, drop your qualifications requirements, assess for things other than max marks from your, from your school certificate, look for what your job really, really means and requires, and then um, you know, recruit. And then we on the flip side said, starting from the job backwards, what is a young person capable of? That's not visible on their CV. That's not visible through their GPA. And assess for that and bring that to the marketplace. And we iterated over time. We started off with 40 placements, mostly in the formal economy, in retail finances, et cetera. And we grew to about 10,000. And this past year, we crossed half a million pathways. And I know that scale might still seem small in comparison to a lot of what India does, but for the South African context, it was big. And I think a huge part of the creation of the national asset was partnership with government and partnership with employers. So as I mentioned from the get-go, partnership with the city of Johannesburg, um, we were really grateful to build on that with a track record to say, we can place young people in the thousands. We can create job op opportunities in the thousands. Um, this past year, when we launched this partnership with the Presidential Youth Employment Intervention, um, it was a huge milestone. So on June 16th, um, this past year, President Ramaphosa actually mentioned us by name. He launched SA Youth, which effectively Harambe and its platform and its matching and algorithm took a back seat and we became SA Youth instead. So we lost our actual brand identity in some ways and became SA Youth, which is a multi-channel platform that young people can access through the phone, through SMS, through an inbound hotline, which is toll free, uh, through the Mobi site, which is data free, um, and a wide variety of platforms, basically, allowing them access to this job site, which now aggregates job opportunities at scale. Um, so it, it makes these job opportunities visible to young people at scale. We also made a conscious choice to zero rate, which means to drop data costs for our um, platform entirely. So we knew that the pandemic showed us that you know, data costs for South African youth in particular was a huge barrier. So they were able to get on a smartphone, but didn't have data, so couldn't access a job site. So we made our, our site data free. So it was completely data free. We learned through this past year, again, with the pandemic that um, smartphones weren't the most important or the only channel. 
um, lots of young people didn't have phones. So we started an SMS and a toll free hotline that was inbound. Um, so we realized that young people love talking. You know, they want to, we had an outbound call center where we would be able to contact young people. It's manned by 300 people, most of whom are former work seekers themselves. And they would, you know, be able to call young people registered on our, on our Mobi site. But it was just as important for young people to call us. So when we launched the toll-free hotline, our call sur volume surged and we, were re we realized that, you know, young people want to talk through their experience, fix a problem on the Mobi site. You know, their, their ID wasn't working or they didn't have the requisite information that was needed for a job application. So that was a huge turning point as well. And so um, now, 10 years later, building on this evidence base, building on a million iterations, and we still don't have it right. Um, today, I can sort of confidently say we're trying and we've launched the space too. As I mentioned, we partnered with the Department of Basic Education um, last year to launch this huge program to uh, recruit teachers assistants, short-term programs, the government stipended programs um, through our platform, meaning that we now have national reach. So it's not just formal economy, not just counting in the city of Joburg, but we actually can reach a tiny little um, village in, in South Africa um, and give visibility to the government of these young people who were not visible to them until now. So that's very in short and not in a nutshell sort of our journey to date I would say that you know the, the biggest lessons we've learned on that front are around partnerships, um, especially with the government. Um, iteration, we've tried and tried and tried again and made many, many mistakes. And, um, and then putting young people at the center, which is the heart of our, our, our approach, which is making sure that it's designed with inclusion at the outset. So probably I said a lot, but yeah, happy to maybe unpack Oh, that. this is beautiful and this is fascinating because in this quick uh, example, you have illustrated all that all of us collectively have been discussing on how do you build a highly inclusive infrastructure like the one you have built with SA Youth, uh, ranging from people who don't have data to people who don't have uh, you know phones and and so many things. Uh, and on the other end, you have built so many different solutions for matchmaking uh, and uh, onboarding people. You have created network effects with the government and 42 country, uh, or, which is a fascinating transition, uh, starting with 40 jobs to being able to access every corner of, of the country. And I think, and that is what is, uh, so exciting. Let's hear some more perspectives uh, from Shami. So Shami, um, I think in the story that you shared so far, what has been uh, very interesting is how it emerged, right? It's continuously evolving, pivoting, evolving, pivoting. So, uh, and you have been at the different junctions of Harambi's evolution. Share some of the important uh, so to say ideas and your important lessons of you are pivoting and iterating and yet scaling right so it's like it's like an unfolding helix right it's changing and getting bigger uh, what happened and what were some of the lessons that you picked up and even some of the challenges and failures that you had to navigate while pivoting and growing at the same time I mean, that's that's a really a great example, an unfolding helix. Um, I'm going to keep that and, and use that afterwards. <laughs> it does kind of feel like that, you know, in some ways. I think for us, we've been very a, a huge fan of the lean impact model, which is sort of try, test, iterate, sort of think big, but act, start small. So I think just, you know, narrow in on the problem, understand what you're trying to solve for. So in the early days, it was demand supply mismatch. So employers said they wanted this um, and young people said they had this. So X and Y, and it, that couldn't meet. And so it was just say, okay, let's zero in on that. What do you really want and what do you really have? And bring those two together. I think over time, we've also realized that, um, you know, there's other issues in terms of barriers to, to, to from a systems point of view. And so for us, I think the iteration has been kind of a, almost a step function rather than a hockey stick function, I would say. So everyone thinks scale is like neat and linear. For us, it's about, Scale, sort of solve a problem at the point of friction, um, scale, and then plateau, because you have to consolidate those learnings. So I think the learnings when we had to solve for employer um, and skills gaps, that was our you know, first few years. We actually plateaued at that space, really got good, 
bedded down the insights and then built the machine to support that to scale even further before we took the next change to say, okay, now we've done this, let's move to the next issue, which is that of job creation and understand how to actually zero in on creating jobs for young people in partnership with government and in incentivizing um, others to, to hire young, young people in particular. So I would say it's a step change function for us. We think of scale as a step, step change function. Um, the other, perhaps, maybe you, you asked about lessons learned. I would say, well, firstly, there are many, many, many lessons learned. Um, the sec maybe two things stand out. One, in the early days, when we started working with employers, we kind of took their word as gospel, not because, and again, I think this is a, you know, people in this space really understand that what employers say and what they mean and what they really need are very different things. And so, for example, we started out saying, you know, employers said we need maths marks, you know, that your math marks are super critical for this particular job, whether it's accounting job or a cashier job or storefront employee. And we're like, yeah, great. So we sourced young people, we assessed them for maths, um, et cetera. And almost all people, young people failed um, those tests that employers set out for them. And we know that the legacy in South Africa is a poor education system, unfortunately, just as a legacy of apartheid, et cetera. It takes a long time to address those issues. But then we, we said, let's, let's, let's pivot a bit. Let's rethink this issue, turn it on its head and say, what are you really looking for? So I'll never forget, you know, a specific example of an employer where they said, we want someone to be a packer in a warehouse. They don't need to know extensive maths, but they need to be able to count in groups of six and groups of 12. That's simple. That's not a maths test result. It's about a specific skill that's related to how packaging is done in the warehouse. And then you're able to actually both assess for that to a young person with a young person. And two is, and forgive my dog barking at the background. I live in Kenya and there's monkeys all over. So my apologies, it's driving my dogs crazy right now so much. Um, it's okay. But, so the the we really we realized that you know people need to be able to demonstrate the skill of counting in sixes and dozens and that is something that's both eminently accessible and trainable and so people with that competency could actually go and and you know develop and fine tune that skill so the first lesson was don't take what especially employers and private sector say as gospel or fact check everything and iterate based on you know small basic steps of, of, of what is actually really important. Maybe another example is around our, our platform overall. So um, we, you know, now when I look back, you know, our platform looks so slick. It's, um, it's you know, there's, the, there's a cloud computing com component to it. Our database engineers are really incredible. They, they're able to put lots of fancy things on, you know, business intelligence, Microsoft BI. Three and a half years ago, we engaged in a massive platform deployment um, and, a, and a build that took several wrong missteps. So we um, tried to you know, in-house everything, we spec'd it out. We had a couple of developers, Google came to us, you know, RippleWorks Foundation sent us some people to build a, you know, an internal um, cloud computing system. And we took several wrong turns before we got it right. Um, we, and I think we also didn't, we wanted a, a complete end-to-end -end package as opposed to, again, building blocks, you know, starting step-by-step. Step. And instead of having the big picture in mind and starting with the building blocks, we wanted to almost turn all of it into this big system. So move all of the recruitment online, move all of the sort of algorithms that we built to date that were putting young people more inclusive hiring in the front of the queue and put that online. We had to do it little by little. And so we realized that um, importantly, any change is, is incremental. And even if we had sort of big visions and big designs, we had to start with the smallest possible iteration of it, test it, test it and you know, get user feedback importantly, and then finally you know, sort of build the next block rather than building it all at once in one, one big bang. I don't know if any of that resonates with your, your oh, team. I think, uh, I think all of them are very familiar uh, grounds for all of us on this call because many of us on this call have burnt our fingers the same way and, um, and are headed for journeys where there is a high potential of burning our fingers in the same way. So it's a good uh, lesson in that sense. But the point is that 
there be there must have been times of huge pressure because when you're working with this scale mindset and everybody's pushing you to sort of deliver short term and and start questioning why are you doing things like this why don't you just get on with getting few people jobs and, and rather than sort of building this infra and building the relationship with the government and thinking about the long term and consolidating your each step and i'm sure there must have been a lot of traditional forces which would say why are you doing it that way why don't you just go ahead and do the classical do a program pilot it do an ict and just go ahead and replicate how did you how did you protect your space to do the what you wanted to do that is such a good question i to be very honest i think it is actually comes down to um a little bit of leadership to be very honest and i would say i would credit mariana our ceo with that um, capability of being able to protect our team that was innovating from the sort of pressures of of a lot of you know some of the stakeholder management and other pieces and we have a very robust and different and diverse and uniquely skilled team uh, you may have met some of our um yes. exco members none of us has a similar skill set to be very honest and i think that's actually the huge strength um so some of us are you know i'm saying us now in the in the collective but some of us um work a lot with government some of us work a lot with with donors some of us work a lot with the data um and the pressure has been immense at certain times i think you know jobs fund i think in particular when we were um partnering with them we had specific targets to reach uh we had um specific auditing requirements to meet our finance team in particular has also been incredibly strong in supporting um you know the whole sort of being sort of an infrastructure that helps throughout on the one hand so i'm not giving you a clear answer so i think what it's one is sort of assembling a di diverse skills team so just people with different skill sets that are actually capable of doing things um at, with expertise two is sort of giving them the space and the full free reign to actually make mistakes and we have made those mistakes we have chosen the wrong platform we have done things poorly etc we have you know disappointed employers but fixing it quickly and so understanding both you know building a diverse team giving people freedom and a, a brain to operate and then being sort of like a and being able to connect the dots across the entire system so finance does not need to just know about finance and they do sit in on meetings where we discuss our jobs targets to say what is a job a work experience defining a job in our space is a very tricky thing so is it 4 months is it 5 months is it 6 months what is the sort of contract that you have to demonstrate our finance team needs to know this and so being able to respond to the pressure especially that of government um has required this diverse team free reign and the ability to actually understand across dimensions not just your own so um i think that's been a unique sort of skill set that mariana in particular our ceo has been able to bring and leverage and we have this um different you know i think the differently skilled team as a result um maybe one last uh piece is we really take our work very seriously we don't take ourselves very seriously so we laugh a lot so we actually and that's actually a really important part of our organizational culture we um you know have a even during the pandemic throughout our stand up calls and you've been to one of them yes. we play music yes. at the start and music at the end yes. we and we're a youth organization we have to be fresh and fun and funny and understand that we have to take joy in our work we have to be lighthearted and so that has been the the real test in terms of our organizational culture to do, to respond to some high pressure situations um across the board so i think for us yeah i don't know if that that makes sense to yeah. you but yeah yes i do recollect that friday uh, that friday when i could join the stand up meeting and it was so much fun with the music playing and it was amazing uh, very inspiring no this is this is so good thank you so much i want to spend the few minutes that we have left uh, on sharmi the leader so this is now about you as a person not about harambe um in this journey uh, what have been some of the transitions that you your team you are the chief impact officer so obviously there's a lot of pressure on show me this show me that show me results validate prove and so 
internally you would have had to sort of say imbibe certain things and why i ask you this question is the the room here today is also working with some of the changes we all have to go through internally all the time so i would love to hear from you what are the transitions that you have gone through as a person as a professional in your life to be able to do this with with uh, harambe for so long gosh that's a, that's an interesting question and i don't reflect on it often i guess but um maybe i'll give you two sort of observations slash reflections when i joined harambe i prior to this i worked at a place called african leadership academy um where i built something called africa careers network which was advising um young people across africa into internships and jobs and i derived great joy from that because it was young connecting young people to opportunities but it was doing it in the hundreds and maybe yeah just we reached about a couple of thousand i was desperately keen to have you know some sort of impact on this youth unemployment challenge at scale and so when harambe was um launching an office in rwanda i put my hand up and said you know that's definitely going to be me i'm i'm really keen because harambe's model was so um was systemic and scale as well and so so that for me was a turning point just in terms of saying taking that desire and passion to impact young people break down barriers and create opportunities but really scale it i don't think i completely envisaged sort of the journey i would have walked <laughs> until today and i think in the past 18 months um in particular i have i mean i've always been you know a fan of harambe's work knowing nikola for for now over a decade but i have never been so awed by sort of a, you know an organization whose mission is to really shift the dial on unemployment like the way harambe does in a way that really pushes me as a as a leader but with great humility and i think for me the big lesson this past 18 months or two years in particular as we've crafted our systems change agenda which is moving away from direct delivery moving away from just training alone to partnering with government dropping our brand you know powering this sort of national platform has been a lesson in humility and a lesson in knowing that knowing your worth but understanding what it is to get the job done in partnership with everyone and i'll say this you know i've always been a big believer in speaking multiple languages and i don't mean you know just actual languages although i am a fan of speaking multiple languages i think it's about speaking language of the boardroom of the you know community based organization of the government entity of the private sector employer and i think that harambe has been able to do that in a really material way and that's tapping into my strength as a leader as well and i felt like i've grown that muscle repeatedly over these past 18 months to say how do you convey what we do how do you get people on board how do you discuss the concept of you know an incentive to hire inclusive youth um to the employer to the government entity um and really meeting people where they are and really tapping into the passion a combined passion of wanting to solve a problem that is quite huge um so that's one piece um i think the second thing is about storytelling i've um had a lot of introspection in terms of understanding the, the power of storytelling again it is about connection and communication etc but um people don't want just smart ideas smart ideas are great and they are helpful and they do change the world but if you cannot connect with someone at a core emotional sort of human level it's actually impossible to affect change and this is true of the donor as it is of the government bureaucrat as it is of the young person and so again i think this past 18 months in particular has been a huge lesson in understanding the power of storytelling um and to modulate your way of telling stories to different audiences to be able to get people on board um and i'm privileged to work in an organization that also has that i mean my ceo i mentioned mariana is is exceptional at that and i learned a lot from her um maybe one last thing is i've been and i don't know if it's okay to say this i've also been scared shitless sometimes <laughs> this past year just in terms of <laughs> being being responsible for this um really big big piece of work and not knowing if it's going to succeed and not knowing if we'll meet our targets not knowing if we will actually um help improve the the prospects of young people and for me that is fuel and that actually is motivating because it actually makes me very sure to 
do my best in partnership with the company that we have and the, the culture and the organization that we've built. Um, we have a word at uh, Harambe called scare sighted, which is both scared and excited. And we are constantly scare sighted because if we're not scared enough, if we're, but if we're not excited enough, we're not going to do it. So I think for us, it's about partnering with each other to really, um, yeah, use that sort of scare sighted feeling to as motivation. Um, and we don't sort of, as I said, we take the problem we want to solve very seriously. We don't take ourselves that seriously. It doesn't matter what title you have, you, you do what needs to get done. Um, and I think that's really helped me this past 18 months in particular, I would say. And despite the feeling of scare sightedness, I think we, um, we were able to get through the day and actually get stuff done. That is such a fascinating takeaway for me personally, scare sighted. I will never forget that word uh that's that's beautiful and thank you for sharing that deep sense of fear that we all carry uh not because of what we can or cannot do but because of the responsibility that we chose to shoulder right so i think that is the one that scares the daylights out of us if in one word you were to say we have learned so much from you what is that one thing that you find interesting about societal thinking very selfish question but i thought i'll just ask I mean, one word is really hard, Sanjay, <laughs> but um, I would say um, amplification, because for me, there's, I've always felt like, you know, you mentioned the sort of what the burgeoning helix, et cetera. For me, societal thinking is about amplification of your impact. It's beyond just sort of what you're doing right now. It's actually amplifying the impact at, and thinking of ways in which you, you, you wouldn't even, you know, have conceptualized at the outset. Um, so for me, it's that amplification. So that's what comes to mind when I think of societal platform. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for your kind time, sharing your perspectives and giving us uh, the amazing concept of scarce sighted. That's good. Um, and um, we wish you all the very best. Uh, and um, all our best wishes are with you as you make a massive difference. Uh, and we hope to leverage that beyond uh, where you are and so like shanti said she would connect with you offline and you wanted to have a chat there's a lot that we can all do together and so looking forward to it uh, thanks once again take care and be well thank you it was a pleasure to meet you all thanks thank you so much thank you so much Bye.